Hello, good evening. Uh, I'm Himanshu and welcome to this webinar on future of cybersecurity in metaverse era. I'm delighted to have you all here. When it comes to cybersecurity, it is not just a buzzword. It is a necessity in the metaverse. The metaverse is a virtual environment where people connect, interact, and shop using immersive technologies like VR and AR. It is the next evolution in social connection like the internet, but it is more immersive. This also opens up new opportunity for cyber criminals to exploit vulnerabilities, steal identities, and scam users. According to the latest surveys, cybersecurity and privacy were the top concerns holding back executives and consumers from adopting the metaverse. Some of the cybersecurity challenges of the metaverse include uh, how do we protect our personal data and identity in the metaverse, or how do we ensure that our privacy and security while using any of the AR or VR devices? How do we prevent cyber attacks and frauds that attack our digital assets and transactions? And how do we deal with ethical and legal issues that arise from our actions and interactions in the platform? These are some of the questions that we will explore in this webinar with our panel of experts. Our speakers will provide insights on how Metaverse is transforming the industry, which core technology power the Metaverse and much more. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that we have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions, please submit them using the comment feature and we'll try to answer them as many as possible. Joining from in-house expert and in-house research team is my colleague, Achal Agrawal. With career spanning almost a decade, Achal is currently working as research consultant in ICT domain. She's one of the key members of the TechSci family and with, with rich experience in management consulting, she looks after the emerging technology division, which comprises of Web 3.0, Metaverse, cybersecurity, and TechSci. Over to you, Achal. Thank you, Himanshu. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for such a warm welcome, Himanshu. Metaverse. What is Metaverse? Metaverse is the emerging 3D-enabled digital space that uses virtual reality, augmented reality, and other advanced internet technology to allow people to have lifeline personal and business experiences online. The more immersive the Metaverse become, the more dangerous the cyber attacks will be. Cyber criminals are always looking for new ways to exploit vulnerability, vulnerabilities and steal data. They are also becoming more sophisticated in their attacks. Cybersecurity will be very important in the metaverse because it will protect users from fraud, hacking and other cyber crimes. So as you see in screen, as per the uh, global cybersecurity report, which was published by TechSci, the market of global cybersecurity was around 177.52 USD billion in 2022. And the market is expected to grow by around 332.26 USD billion by 2028. Some of the factors which are responsible for huge growth is increasing number of cyber attacks, rising digitalization, emergence of e-commerce platforms, deployment of cloud solutions, and obviously increased number of data breaches. Next slide. Uh, as per another report, global metaverse products and solution market, the market of metaverse products and solutions was around 65 billion USD billion in 2022. And the market is expected to grow by 667 billion, which a huge CHR of 48.89%. What are the major reasons for that? Basically, the rising focus on converging digital and physical worlds, increase in media and entertainment, online gaming, digitalization in the fashion, retail and art industry. These are the factors which are responsible for such a huge growth in metaverse products and solutions market. This is the survey, recent survey done by Texai Research, where the respondent size was 500 and the questions were asked about the cyber threats which are currently facing by the respondents. As per the respondents, around 86% of the respondents face that invisible avatar or man in the room attacks is the major cybersecurity threat faced in metaverse. 81% face that cloning of voice and facial features is the major cybersecurity threat. 
Another is hijacking video recordings. Others include that virtual threat and the uh, steal of identity. Next one was the question that whether the respondents are confident in their ability to curb threats in the metaverse or not. Around 52% of the audience say that they are not confident in their ability to curb the threats. 33% respondents were neutral and only 15% of the respondents are confident in their ability to curb threats in the metaverse. Obviously, that means that we need a solid support plan to to curb the threats, to miti mitigate the threats of cybersecurity. This was the survey which was done. Around 87% of the respondents said, yes, they need a proper cybersecurity plan to mitigate the threats of cyber, to mitigate the threats of cyber attacks, which will be helpful in metaverse. Thank you. Over to you, Himanshu. Rising and much more. Thank you, Achal, for providing insights related to the market sizing and much more. Another speaker for the event is Mr. Abhishek Das. He's currently working with EY as the Director of Technology Transformation, IT, and Digital Risk. In his current role, Abhishek drives and leads strategic client engagements, tech transformation projects, risk and control assurance advisory, and much more across India for new business services in the technology, digital, and risk portfolios. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Manchu and Ajal. I think uh, and also very warm uh, good afternoon and good evening from uh, you know from wherever the users and the listeners are listening in from. So uh, I think you've pretty much set the context in terms of what Metaverse is and uh, that covers and frees up some time for Rahul and uh, Hariji to get on to more because uh, some of my slides were about what essentially metaverse can do and what it is but now uh, just to give you in, in terms of some uh, you know hard hitting stats um there's been a major breach of more than 2.5 million us dollars just three days back on a, a meta platform essentially where nfts which is you know the tokens were uh were cloned and uh, you know, there was a, a proxy which was set up to clone the tokens itself. And that kind of speaks of how the world of metaverse is really evolving, how the changes have really started taking place. And the risk is, is already here. It, it's not something that we can plan anymore. It's something that we got to be bracing ourselves for. And, you know, it's an interesting uh, word, the metaverse, right? So while we all know what it does, uh, you know, I thought it's interesting to put up what the origin of the word is. And that really comes in from a a, a fantastic novel that I've recently read uh, called The Snow Crash uh, by, uh, by Neil Stevenson. And that's where, you know, it, it shows that how uh, different avatars and uh, of, of humans and entities really converse with each other. And that was the origin of the word metaverse, which essentially is, uh, you know, uh, the universe of uh, meta bodies together, right? Now, if I move on, uh, if you can move to the next slide, please. What really comprises of metaverse, right? So we, I, I think fundamentally uh, when the whole digital transformation journey um, we made a lot of noise about it and you know companies and businesses and leaders spoke oh you know we, we are we're going the digital transformation way our organization is spending x amount of money on digital transformation but what was digital transformation essentially it was automating a few things or um, you know computerizing a few things which were otherwise done manually right or it was done by a, a, a bunch of humans who were skilled for that particular piece of work and then they you know kind of got into office did their jobs really well collaborated and went back home now with the era of the internet and um you know himanshu you mentioned about the web 3.0 and i'm going to touch upon that later but as internet came in and internet 2.0 or the web 2.0 came in people realized that you possibly don't need so many manual interventions you possibly need you don't need so many uh, humans or you don't need so many paper waste things to be done you know essentially it could all be created through a piece of code or through an infrastructure invitation and how you can actually move on to getting things done which was more uh, specific to the human mind for people to do and the rest could be just left to systems and machines to do and that's where you know so much of automation came in and that was digital transformation now if i if i speak of a simple concept right and this might 
it might seem extremely uh, silly at the start of it, but I think the whole concept of RPAs really started off about 25 years ago. Because if you see what an ATM machine is, it is nothing but uh, you know the bank really automating its processes of what you would otherwise have a a, a teller or a, in the bank sitting and looking at the amount of balance you would have on your account and giving you the amount of money that you have and then giving you a paper piece of slip. That's essentially what an ATM machine does, isn't it? And uh, that's what a bank did about 20, 25 years ago in the country. And uh, that was nothing but a classical example of an RPA. Or if you look at what elevators did, it was nothing but finding out what flow you want to go. You press in the right button, the, you know, the elevator comes in. I think these were all innovations that came in. And we as humans tend to kind of make a big deal about certain things which have been already coming on, right? And I think Metaverse essentially is uh, a culmination of technology, cyber, the power of the internet, and the, the giving the power to the user to essentially take those decisions which are otherwise, uh, you know, kind of limited or controlled for him or her. And that's where the risk really comes in. Because the, the moment you open up the whole field for someone to come and make those changes and someone to come and dictate the way the future of the internet should work, that's where the real risk is. And if, if you look at what's really happening recently, right, people are speaking about how chat GPT, which was almost a, you know, uh, uh, you know, a layman possibly didn't know about chat GPT uh, till about the start of the year. And then when it suddenly came in, now everybody speaks of chat GPT. The other day I was, I was looking at a, you know, at a restaurant here back in London, uh, where, you know, you have a chain of, of uh, restaurants where you can go and place in your order and actually customize your meal, just having a conversation with chat GPT. And that's how customized things are getting. But at the same time, if you see the the buzz around the internet is when the founders of the chat GPT or people who are actually uh, looking at the next version of chat GPT are actually sensitizing people about the risks or, you know, the, 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 the vulnerabilities that can come through, uh, through chat GPT or, uh, you know, AI uh, and the powers of, of it. And that's where the catch 22 is essentially, you know, how do you harness what is really good and how do you mitigate what is really bad, right? So essentially what uh, I wanted to put out was that, you know, when you look at the metaverse, you're looking at having a very persistent systems. Obviously it is live. It's, it's really touching everyone. It's extremely wow. decentralized. And at the same time, it doesn't have those boundaries that were initially set up. Right. Uh, if you can move to the next slide. <clears throat> and this is essentially the journey of the evolution, right? When we actually spoke of, you know, the mainframes. And I, I remember back when I started my career with uh, using, a, you know, a, a AS400 machine and al almost everything really looked like the matrix, you know, green uh, numbers coming in and we had to take a piece of pen and paper and, uh, um, you know, and actually jot down the scores for someone who was very new to coding and, it really came in with those eras of uh, even if you wanted to uh, play a game on the computer, you know, you had to put in a line of code on the on the on the DOS prompt, etc., and get in there and you know for floppy drives and see where we are, right? I mean, in in just about twenty years' time, we've reached a stage where here we are. I, I think um, uh, I'm not sure where Rahul and Arijit are from, but maybe you know we are we are from uh, possibly <clears throat> three different. Uh, or four different uh, places sitting on this call with users, maybe from multiple countries together and uh, all seamlessly conversing with each other, right? And that's possibly been the fastest evolution that's happened. And we at EY, you know, are extremely um, uh, confident about one thing in terms of the sense of evolution. I think the disruption that technology has made over the last three years uh, has been the fastest that it has been over the last 30 years, right? Essentially, if you look at it. And uh, that's exactly what's going to happen in the next couple of years, because you see the way the speed uh, or the or the ramp up of things have been. And, you know, while COVID has uh, def definitely been one of the most unpleasant phases of each one of our lives. But I think from a digital standpoint, uh, it's just ramped up a lot of things, which essentially was otherwise a piece of a roadmap or a strategy for a lot of organizations that they wanted to get to. But it was always like, if you're if it's not broken, you don't need to fix, right? So, and COVID kind of broke everything. And then you had to fix everything almost seamlessly. And that's where, you know, so many technology innovations came in, interventions came in, the power of AI was harnessed and all of that. But, and this is a point that I kind of speak to a lot of my clients on, has the pace of our innovation been a little too fast, right? To actually look at the risks that it has brought through. Maybe with the pace that we've gone ahead and, you know, we've, 
deployed technologies, we've gotten AIs, we've gotten uh, got into the metaverse, and you know we've started selling land, we've started doing transactions. Governments have gone into the metaverse. Users are transacting on the metaverse. But at the same time, while this is all great, have we really looked at those risk elements, those vulnerabilities, or what are those possibilities of the cyber threat that we've opened up in this journey, right? If you just move to the next slide, Himanshu. So while we look at it, right, and uh, you know this is pretty basic, but I think for some of our users, uh, these could be terms that you resonate with. Uh, so if you look at the blockchain, or if you look at how payments and identity has really changed, or the gaming engine, VR, ARs, and obviously the uh, you know the IOTs, you know there's a concept now which is called the AOT, which is essentially the AI and the or the AI of things, right? Which is essentially uh, moving things to the next level. Uh, and I'm I'm going to give you a small example where, you know, when we were uh, talking to one of our clients who was, who was a major into the auto sector, uh, the biggest risk that came in was, you know, these cars all have fancy, um, you know, navigation systems and have really fancy Bluetooth devices and media devices, etc. And there was a cyber breach uh, that happened through the uh, the the radio system of the car which could essentially pick up everything that the GPS was throwing off personal user. And that user data was actually sold to businesses. Now, just think about it. You know, when I'm sitting in my car, I'm having a conversation with my family. I'm having a conversation about work. I'm having a conversation with my colleagues. Uh, I'm going to places which are possibly, say, for, for dinner, for a movie, to the mall, to workplaces, to my friends. Uh, I, I am spending... Uh, money is at the petrol pumps and there is a card which I'm kind of swiping in, all of that, right? And if you look at it, all this data essentially is everything about me. And uh, just imagine uh, the, the, the hackers actually without intruding into anything into my home system, etc., just hacked into my my AVs and my you know music players in my car, saw everything that I'm doing, heard all the conversations I had, looked at all the places I visited. Uh, and this data was sold, and essentially they know everything about me as a user, right? Just think how scary this could be. And and I'm going to multiply this at least four times when I'm on the metaverse, because in, on the metaverse, there's no physical me, right? There's no physical car, there's no physical uh, music system. Everything is virtual, and there, if there is something which is a vulnerability, and the vulnerabilities are essentially the basics, right? And these could be your, your usual stuff that happened 10 years ago, your you know, your identity and access managements, your data leaks, your data protection devices, your firewalls, your routers, it essentially starts from the basics, right? Because what a metaverse is essentially hosted on the internet and the internet is on your machine. So everything really starts from the basics. And if we don't take a step back and look at where we've gone wrong on the basics, the metaverse is here to kill, right? So if you can just go to the next slide, please, Amancho. <laughs> yeah, so when I spoke about these examples, the reason I'm kind of stressing upon the fact of going back to the basics is because for any business out in the world, the only thing that matters to them is revenues, right? The only thing that the CEO would look at is how their brand is performing, how the company is performing, how the the, uh, the shake, stakeholders or the shareholders really uh, kind of in, investing more confidence into the company. And there are a couple of areas that if you look at, right, uh, marketing, revenue, expansion, and efficiencies have been the four key pillars on which you know, CEOs are really betting their monies on when it comes to investing on the metaverse, because this is a huge amount of money that you're going to put through. And if you don't really have these four pillars, which are going to cover you from the overall uh, either brand perception, brand reputation, brand stickiness, customer experience, uh, the whole cost optimization strategy, reaching out. And what if, what are you doing on the metaverse? It's just not about being a buzzword just because my counterparts or my uh, you know competition is doing it it's also because i want to see those differentiating factors be it from the in how a company perceives me or how how my customers perceive me on the marketing initiative or what revenues am i making now if you look at it the the, the reason i'm investing onto say a, a piece of land on the metaverse is because i'm not going to possibly do that physically sitting out of a BKC in Mumbai or a cyber hub in Gurgaon, right? And I'm going to get onto the metaverse. I'm going to set up a, a branch of myself 
on the metaverse. I'm going to have my users conversing with me while they are sitting at a mall, possibly, or watching a movie. And that's how the transactions are going to be. And I'm trying to do that because I want to I want to make a very seamless experience for my users. But if there's not, if there's going to be even an iota of doubt in terms of the security, and if there's going to be one breach of this, there goes my entire investment that a company would have made. So if as a user, I realize that you know there was a hack or if it's in the news about a particular impersonation that's happened on the metaverse, there goes all the investments et cetera, that are made. And if you look at all the four pillars, each one of them actually linked to each one, right? So essentially, before you move to the metaverse, and this is something that I kind of would put out as a disclaimer and a guard for any company who's looking to move to the metaverse, you need to understand three things. One, is the metaverse really for you, right? So we, we say it or we kind of claim that, oh, the metaverse is here. But does it mean that the metaverse is here for you, right? So please take a step back, understand whether you really need to be on the metaverse, right? The second one is if you have to be on the metaverse and if you've chosen to be on that side, have you really looked at the basics, right? And when I say about the basics, I go back to 15 years ago, right? I, I look at everything, right? From a, a simple VA, a PT, you know, doing a incident response check, doing a a DLP check, everything that could go wrong on your basic dues from running a technology shop to the time having your attestations, your compliances from a regulatory standpoint, from a compliance standpoint, from a data standpoint. And then obviously, you know, the cyber privacy and having the state of the art sort of defense mechanisms. But to the time you really reach the defense mechanism, you've got to understand the basics of having the right policies, the processes, the frameworks, the users. And most importantly, on the metaverse, unless you don't have a group of people who really understand how to run the metaverse, there's always chances of a big failure coming about. And the third point that I think businesses should be aware of is where do they want to reach on the metaverse? Right? One is having an avatar and you know a gamification of things, but essentially, is it the only thing you're looking at? Because today, if companies are dealing with bitcoins and cryptocurrencies, a lot of people really don't know how the back end of all of this really works on blockchain, right? It's a, it's a complex web and that's why possibly it's a web 3.0, but till the time businesses don't really get their heads around understanding the architecture of these things because a metaverse has touch points which are going to be touching every end of an, or of an IT ecosystem. It could be your applications, your infrastructures, your third party vendors, your suppliers, your dealers, your distributors. All of that really has a touch point when it really comes here, right? Uh, if you could just move to the next slide. Right now, I'm not going to spend too much time on this one, but if you see, and I'm going to throw up an interesting stat, um, at, at a sample size, right, almost uh, on every phone today, right, we all spend almost 90% of our time on 90% of applications which were created or were really uh, formed in the last nine years. That's an interesting number that you should know because none of these that you see on web point, web 2.0 really were in their shape and form that it is today. You know, be it an Instagram, uh, you know, the, the, the Twitters of the world, the Facebooks, the Ubers, everything, you know, when you see the final product of it was just over the last decade, right? And today we spend almost entirely our day on the phone on these applications, right? And which also means what about those businesses which were there before that, right? Those businesses have to stay. Those businesses have to evolve and those businesses need to be relevant. And the only way to stay relevant is by innovating. And these are the companies, the larger ones, which are the most keen to get onto the metaverse because they want to be the differentiators. They want to be the ones that want to compete back with the smaller guys or the ones which were the smaller guys earlier. But now over the last 10 years, have just become way, way, way larger than anyone really anticipated them to be. Right. And if you look at the Web 3.0, some of the names that you see there are all bit Bitcoins and currencies and, you know, cryptos, etc. And this is a complex world because while the community today on the call possibly understands what this is, maybe a generation before us, you know, our parents, our grandparents, our, you know, someone who is even maybe our teachers, they don't know what this is. Right. For them, this is a major area of concern and area of risk. So if you're looking at addressing a particular segment of the market, you also need to understand the psyche, the buying patterns, the behavior patterns, and get them educated and trained in terms of how do you use it. Otherwise, it's just going to be, you know, a job half done, right? We just move to the next slide, please. 
right? So I'm not going to spend too much time on this one. But what I wanted to speak on here is while we've spoken about the metaverse and how the rise has really happened, there are going to be essentially about 10 to 12 pillars, which are the most important ones to look at, right? Obviously, privacy without saying, and I don't need to kind of explain that that's paramount because once something about you is lost, you are lost for the business, right? It's as simple as that because you just want to want to trust something that can't protect your uh, data and your, your you know your privacy rights as such. Uh, obviously, you need to ensure how do you protect uh, the kids, you know the 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 people who don't know how exploitation on the internet could happen. And when I say kids, I also be, I'm, I'm kind of adding the the group of or the section of uh, you know our user bases which are the slightly more elderly who don't know the uh, the cons of using a metaverse. Well, the, the pros are extremely fancy to look at. There could be severe amount of cons which could really impact. Uh, the health concerns, obviously, you know, there are, uh, you know, being, and this is basics, you know, we've always heard don't spend too much time on the computer and don't, you know, uh, be the ones who are getting your eyes screwed up once and for all. But then I think with the uh, metaverse, uh, you know, we have to be extremely mindful about those areas. We're talking about, uh, you know, two of the very, very, key areas of metaverse is the whole regulation and uh, you know being extremely extremely um, while there are regulations in terms of you know the government obviously not doing anything on that but if if there is a regulation which has been put in a lot of it is actually self regulations or these are all areas which have been defined by each business or each entity by itself and while i know that governments across the world are working on having regulated frameworks and regulated policies around the whole metaverse uh we still have to be ensure we still have to ensure that you know in terms of the access uh inequality or the uh, or the packaging in terms of how your identity is is protected or your privacy rights are the do's and the don'ts of the basics of metaverse in terms of how the transaction needs to be what should be the age group who should be the users etc needs to be very very well regulated if we move to the next slide um, there are a few more areas around the whole intellectual property rights, about how competition laws are, about how AM, AML works, and obviously KYC, because these are areas which have a very, very high transaction, financial, wow. regulatory, and, you know, the whole the whole value chain really revolves around having the right sort of frameworks around the whole transaction of money. Because while you're in the metaverse, one is, you know, the look and feel of it, which I would classify as gaming. The second is the user experience of it, which I would say is a window shopping. And then I would say about the whole transaction, but which is really the business side of it, where people are transacting about the whole, uh, you know, through an NFT or uh, through, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies and actually doing real transactions. And that's where it has to be the most protected. While, you know, at this stage, you would still have a lot of KYC people coming up and asking you to click a selfie or video. You're going digital, right? I mean, earlier, I remember when we used to go for KYC, we used to go and get a thumbprint or, or signature at the branch, you know, people coming and collecting documents, all of that has now become so seamless. But this is the next stage where you want to be extremely KYC compliant on the metaverse. And that's where the big risk comes in, right? We move to the next slide, please. Now, I'm sorry for the readability of the slide, but essentially what we are trying to talk about is on the metaverse, right? There's always a now, a next and a beyond. Right? And when you speak about what is now, we all possibly are trying to grapple with areas. And obviously, uh, Arijit and Rahul, you know, being the experts on this can give us more details on what is the now and the next. But when I speak about the beyond, right, that's the that's the area in terms of so much that can be done on the metaverse. Because essentially, you're just laying out a whole new world. That's what, you know, or, or a whole new universe of endless possibilities where there's nothing really constraining you from being one place and doing business on the other side of it. But at the same time, that only opens up a lot of things in terms of the whole regulatory framework going for a toss. Today, if I want to go and transact in a bank sitting out of Mumbai uh, into, say, Shanghai, there would be certain law of land, there would be certain law of transactions from a finance and finance or from a, a law or, a, a, you know, more from a legal angle, etc. But once the metaverse really opens up, who, who cares and who knows where am I sitting out of, right? And what sort of businesses am I working with? Who are my users? Maybe I'm just talking to a bunch of uh, you know, unethical rogue entities. Maybe I'm transacting with them. Maybe I'm buying into things which I'm not legally allowed to buy in the country, right? We have no control over it. And that's where, you know, the five pillars that I mentioned at the bottom of the screen really come in when it comes to identity, access, privacy, user groups, roles. 
And you know, actually, these are the basics that we've always learned through college about what cybersecurity and laws are, right? But these are also going to be the pillars that's going to hold true when it comes to the metaverse, right? Then move to the next slide, please. So I'm just going to leave this with a few examples and just wanted to show how metaverse is really here, right? If you if you see some of the most popular brands, and this is cross sector. And the reason I wanted to put up non-technology companies because a lot of you know people know that technology companies have moved there, but you know, if if I tell you uh, on the shoe that you're wearing, you know, Nike has has, has moved a lot into uh, the metaverse, or you know, the the uh, the most um, you know an area where you would think metaverse doesn't exist, which is because you need it in in a form is Heineken. I mean, uh, imagine a beer company moving onto the metaverse and you transacting onto the metaverse for a pint of your beer, or companies like you know when you when you talk about um, uh, HSBC, JP Morgan Chase, uh, Amex, etc. Obviously, these are all financial companies onto the metaverse, and I think people are lapping up to it because a lot of people really are transacting with these companies online, offline, and it's been an interesting mix for these companies to really invest. And I think the future of these is going to be extremely, extremely promising. But I and I, I use this for the but that while we're going to get onto the journey of the metaverse, we need to be extremely careful about the hands that this is getting into, right? what sort of sectors are getting into the metaverse and who are the users who are going to be controlling the metaverse because soon there's going to be a regulatory body there's going to be a a, a framework which is going to come through and we've got to be ensuring that there is equality when it comes to it there has to be no rights and wrongs but there has to be a definition of what's supposed to be done because if that doesn't happen i think the power goes into the wrong hands and with the culmination of the ai the ml uh and the the, the you know, whole uh uh, you know, predictive analytics really kicking in, uh, there could be more harm uh, than the goods that might come through with this. So I think that's about it from my end. Uh, and, uh, you know, happy to take it from here. Thank you. Mm, thank you for shedding light on the different end use cases of the metaverse and the challenges related to it and the cybersecurity expect related to it. And it's a speaker joining today is Arjit Bhattacharya. He's the founder and CEO of Virtual Infocom, which is one of the first game and VR development company since 1998. He's the producer of over 300 plus games in VR, AR, with over 25 years of experience in technology, finance, among other sectors. He's an awarded top rated global business leader, celebrated speaker, blockchain specialist, and VR specialist, and a thought leader. Welcome to you, sir. Uh, sir, you are on mute. Thank you for the lovely and beautiful uh, introduction. And really, really happy. And I was listening uh, very, very carefully to my earlier speaker, Abhishek. Abhishek is from Anis and Young, uh, if I'm not wrong. Beautiful data and amazing uh, inputs. Uh, talking about my topic and uh, probably giving a little bit of light uh, before I play around with the English word, which has got 26 letters, I'm going to bore you definitely for next 12 minutes. And uh, in my dictionary, this bore is uh, defined as beginning of re-engineered entrepreneurship. Uh, let me uh, give you a small bit of light from where I'm coming from. Probably this very term metaverse. Uh, came from a beautiful platform which we used to use long, long back called Second Life. In Second Life, uh, we used to have an avatar. You can live a life of uh, another person. You can interact, communicate. Um, well, smartphone was not there, at least uh, from the uh, uh, perspective of Indian market. Smartphone was a bit of luxury at that time. And um, while talking about uh, virtual reality, uh, in those days, this helmet system used to call as, uh, uh, I mean, today's uh, headset used to call as helmet system. And uh, I had the uh, opportunity to work with uh, BoomTube uh, structure as well as Cape system. It was long back when I used to uh, integrate a few bit of things in uh, Southeast Asian market for a couple of our clients. Um, I was getting a vibration that very soon this entire web world is going to have amazing revolution and that revolution will probably change the way we think the way we entertain ourselves the way we communicate and the way we think 
and the next uh, generation of uh, workers needs to have much more skill rather than the theoretical approach. With that note, in Virtual Infocom, we started a, a beautiful concept of taking real actor and actress and then converting them eventually into a 3D character. While doing that, uh, I was looking for a name, like what we should call it as a, as a digital human, or probably we call it as a 3D character taken from a real life model or actor. We couldn't find out a name, but in today's world, probably we call it as meta human. If you can go to the next slide, probably you can see a few bit of example of uh, test cases that we have done so far so good. So these are the uh, 3D character from a uh, few bit of celebrities from Bengali movies. I'm taking this example because it's done long, long back when even meta human world didn't exist. Uh, what we did, we started making these characters for definitely our own game universe, eventually to promote their movies. And eventually we thought that if we are doing that in the gaming universe, why don't we create a 3D world through which a businessman can sell their products. Well, it was really a early days of 2016 when we thought that probably we can integrate and connect a little bit of dresses, little bit of ornaments, little bit of toys through the game. Example, when you're playing the game, you have an ability and um, you have an opportunity to buy these things in real life. Um, say for an example, you love the dress of that particular hero and you really want to buy it. Well, you can buy it in digital world utilizing digital coins, but in real life, there was no opportunities as such. So we, we tried our best to communicate and connect with local shopkeepers. We told them that, okay, fine, there will be a number of customers who will be coming to you. They will scan a code um, in the scanner, which we are giving you as a device. And these people are gamers. So they got a shock. They said that, uh, are you talking something science fiction? We said, no, it's not science fiction. It's a... Uh, something which we, we intend to do. So if you can go to the next slide, probably I can show that. Yeah. So what happened when you are playing those kind of character based games, you have an opportunity to buy such kind of garments in real life. I don't know. I'm not sure how many of gaming companies are till date in 2023 are doing it. I know quite a few number of people, but we did that long back and uh, eventually we started educating the market. But after declaring it, from Amazon that they are going to sell products through game that gave us a lot of lot of encouragement that we are not wrong probably uh, we are in the right track and uh, people will be opting this eventually in near future now how these things are coming with uh, the the very term we are discussing called metaverse when you look at metaverse is basically combination of all those possible deep tech technology that we can think of be that virtual reality, be that augmented reality, be that blockchain in the back end, be that the, the power, be that the optimization techniques of uh, your carbon emission. We are probably talking to uh, a systematic generation where these guys, which we call as probably generation X, Y, are learning things from AI itself. So where is the gap? When we talk about metaverse as such as a platform, the main gap, which I have seen so far so good, because this very topic is related to cybersecurity uh, and definitely a couple of things which is relevant and related to research. I'm going to give you a few bit of test cases, a few bit of probably thought processes, which is there in my mind, how the future will look like. So it's a, a 2018 example. Don't change the slide. You don't need to. Yes, just, just keep in. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, Probably in 2016, I was addressing uh, in China and I was sharing that uh, in near future, when you're driving your car, uh, it's not a driverless car, probably you are driving a very sophisticated luxury car with uh, well-connected IoT devices and you have augmented reality glass, which you are wearing. You're wearing it because you really don't need to use your map in your dashboard, neither do you want to use your smartphone. And the system is like this. It actually knows you better than you. Uh, example, it knows that probably two o'clock, you usually have your uh, little bit of food and you love to go with broccoli, which is uh, with a little bit of cheese and a cup of coffee. So that AR glass eventually will ask you about your choice and it will automatically generate a 
signal which will find out a nearby joint where you can have your own food. If you are affirmative, you say that, okay, fine, I'm going to have the same similar kind of uh, meal, it will order it for you. So once you are there in front of that particular food joint, your order is ready, you consume it or you just have it as a takeaway, completely your choice, that's a human choice that you're having. And then you just go off. What happened in the back end? Because of the encryption level, your bank card is connected with, of course, a centralized mechanism, which is going to give that same payment utilizing blockchain technology towards that particular food joint. Your payment is settled down, you are done. If you're satisfied with your food, the payment will be there in their account. It will be it will be consumed. If you are not happy, it will cross check it once again and it may give you back your money. So in that way, you have an opportunity to saving time. And in that way, you can do much more things. This is just a normal example I'm just trying to portray, which probably would change our future. Now, this is not a story of uh, driving a car and having a food. This is a story of how technology can make a huge impact. And when we talk about metaverse, I'm sure that a lot many of you will agree on the point that metaverse is not going to be only a virtual world. It is going to be basically a combination of virtual world and real world. So connecting those beautiful dots are the main key. There are lot many things which is going on, which probably I can share uh, in front of everyone. Example, if you are utilizing a, a very latest generation uh, smartwatch, you will understand that very soon those watch will have a 3D projection. While communicating with one person to another person, which we are doing in today's world, I'm sure that we are all using this video chat. Eventually, we are probably going towards that uh, future generation of communication wherein your avatar can be projected from one place to another place. Well, it's not new, but very soon uh, teachers from university, they can take classes utilizing their own 3D avatar into multiple different places. And that particular AI avatar can take questions and it can give answer, uh, which is basic kind of answer. Eventually, when machine learning will improvise it, we will see much more difference. Now, are we talking about metaverse, which is uh, more on game development, more on those kind of education? I believe no, there are much more things that is yet to be developed. I know one system which we developed, I can share you that as well. Um, well, uh, there was a client who said that, uh, can we do something with plantation? Can we create a new coin wherein if I give a plant to a new consumer of ours, depending on the health of the plant and depending on how they are nurturing it and it is flourishing, can we increase and improvise the, the valuation of that particular coin? And can you do it utilizing augmented uh, technology wherein we can detect and understand the health of the tree so that the person don't have to take pictures and give us report each and every day? So it's a challenging kind of infrastructure that people are going through, people are thinking of, and it's a, it's a beautiful future which uh, probably will yield to a lot many different things. But the challenge is when we are doing all these kind of stuff, we have a great tree. Well, you can see probably we have made a lot many different kind of uh, uh, 3D avatar characters, we have created uh, platforms or probably not only us, there are multiple different other companies who are doing the same. The challenge is when you scan your retina, when you use your voice message. In fact, right now, if I'm speaking in a podium like this, in a video uh, chat communication method, there is a possibility that these voice can be replicated, can be duplicated. And the possible threat is it can be used against anyone. Not only that, there are apps which ask for scanning your face. The challenge is not scanning your face. The challenge is when you sell these data without permission of the person who is scanning your face or they are talking in a, in a voice chat. So it's, it's not about only the deep tech uh, problem. It's not about the deep tech problem. It's not about the technology. To be very honest, if I, mark, if I may ask all of you, uh, 
when you go to a shopping mall there are people who are asking for your name and your email id and your address and they see that well you can get probably an award or you will get rewarded without knowing anything we share that we don't ask that whether they will be selling this data to a third party or not or where they will take this data even not only that when you go for any kind of purchase for an example uh, in your near shopping mall they will ask for your phone number they will say that i'll send you a digital copy great. cool you're saving paper great but where is the gdpr law which is defining that my number my name my details my choice of choosing objects will not be sold to a third party i think we are not talking about only the metaverse threat we are talking about a lot of policy oriented structure which needs to be updated from the front of various different governments if we look at the latest generation infrastructure i think i have got uh, a minute left for my uh, presentation um, if you look at south korea they recently declared amazing things to be done utilizing metaverse including the business including selling stuff adopting those kind of technology super optimizing them great the only thread that we need to understand the data part of it how we are treating these data well utilizing encryption these things can be optimized there are methods which actually can optimize all these kind of data in a manner that a normal person even though if they get access to these data cannot read it so i know a, a, a boy genius so i was having a discussion with that uh, gentleman he has created a encrypted uh, solution for all these kind of data which generates few bit of zero and one only when you snatch back that data from the database so eventually decrypting it is merely impossible because if you try that it again generates 256 bit another data combination more and more you will try it will give you more and more combinations so it's nearly impossible to crack such kind of data but yes there are smarter people probably they can uh, crack that system as well so as and when we will move i think it's a responsibility of a common person to understand what to do where to do and how to do and yes we need to ask ourselves i'll echo with uh, my previous speaker abhishek uh, do we really need metaverse for your business or not first let's understand this and then move into this era and world thank you so much for inviting me and thanks uh, anchal and himanshu and of course my next speaker uh, i'm eagerly waiting for your speech as well thank you thank you ajit for sharing insights related to meta human uh, moving on to next speaker rahul sethi uh, he is a metaverse expert and the founder of metaverse 911 which is a company specializing in helping businesses to unlock the potential of metaverse he is also the co-founder of exportals which is an immersive tech services company uh, he is a leading web 3.0 and metaverse expert and is also responsible for arranging metaverse trainings and training them in big five companies welcome ra thank you very much and to all the audience arijit abhishek great listening with you listening to you um and anchal himanshu thank you um the context of cyber security in my um in in the way i look at how businesses businesses have to adapt in future is what i am going to cover in this conversation slide slide number 2 so while i think everybody has a a very unique definition of the metaverse while it has to be decentralized subject to the web3 um the motivation from web3 community but it has also been uh, seen that a lot of uh, uh, immersive experiences experiences right now being made are uh, titled as metaverses so the question really is that um, will the metaverses from just a decentralized chain perspective will outgrow the total number of immersive experiences that individual creators or the companies will make over the period of time answer is no both sides will compete with each other with respect to the volume and value of the immersive experiences so at a holistic level slide number 
at a holistic level, um, one has to be very careful when envisaging an immersive experience per se. Whether we want to go and load that in a decentralized, um, decentral and kind of setup, or we want to rather create our own uh, infrastructure and want to load that uh, experience within our own infrastructure, I mean. So the step number one, I believe, is the is the identity which is most likely going to be attacked the first, I, I guess, and that's been happening now uh, over years anyway. Within the metaverse, it makes it more uh, challenging because uh, today morning um, I was with uh, I was in a masterclass with uh, Ernst and Young, and uh, since Abhishek, anyways, represent the company, and uh, the conversation was around the uh, false identity that the avatars can apt. While it is not Rahul, it can be somebody else impersonating me in the metaverse, saying I'm Rahul. So it, it makes it very visual, hence becomes more vulnerable. That's one. Uh, the second part is the existing data breaches is one part, but the data per se is, is not just limited to personal financial data. Data is related to what is the behavioral um, pattern of the user. Uh, the user comes in, uh, he goes into several different types of, ex types of you know, um, experiences being built over there, tracking it, tracking that person to going and creating a connection and then exploiting that individual, sometimes even with respect to manipulating them or post manipulation, harassing them and at some point also intimidating them uh, to get either uh, or either or financial or other types of benefits from that person. Slide number four. And <clears throat> while this will continue to be there, the identity theft is not going to go anywhere in the next 50 years. It is only going to be different ways by which the folks will identify and find that there will be, there will be identity theft of different types. Um, but we do, we do sit down as far as the individual centralized or decentralized experiences are concerned. We do sit on very weak authentication systems. Now, when I say authentication systems being weak is since number one, we deal in the 3D environment. We aren't dealing in a sophisticated DevOps or a sophisticated, uh, you know, in cloud infrastructure where we have got single sign-ons and we, we we are sort of, you know, tracking down to ensuring that certain set of people just log in and things like that. You are in a 3D environment. Um, 3D is already a rendered environment. One of the conversations I had with a very senior executive manager director level of a big five um, a few weeks back on the same subject. And I categorized the metaverse security into three aspects of it. I said, one is that if what if you have a training room that you have training, training, um, you know, um, a building or, a, or an institute that you have created within the metaverse and that you have hundreds and thousands of people come over there and get trained. That's one way to experience in the metaverse. The second one is where you have gotten now some kind of an IoT, which means it's a digital twin of, say, your home or your small factory, small or, or a one section of the factory that you're able to digitally manage in the 3D immersive environment. That's second type of a, uh, of, of a metaverse experience. And the third one is a digital twin of a nuclear plant. So the question really is that what if somebody goes and clicks on a clicks on the 3D digital twin and switches off the washing machine at office or a coffee machine at office? You don't need a layer of authentication. But if somebody goes and shuts down the cooling system of the nuclear plant, then there's a major drama waiting. So thinking of the thinking of the systems, I think it's also important to understand and know how to design in the metaverse that methodology of designing and from a concept all the way to execution that has to be thought through where it's a critical where it's a very critical function in terms of in terms of the business you know um, uh, choice in the metaverse there has to be 
<clears throat> layers of authentication, layers of maybe people involvement built into it. Uh, we sit on the communication protocols which are insecure. Um, well, there, there are two aspects of it. One is that they are definitely insecure communication protocols being used by the metaverse platforms. You know, rather than that, there are. I think the the whole um, the whole thought process in this uh, in designing of the metaverse, uh, you know, uh, experiences is not still around security. There is very less awareness about the security per se. It it seems like if, it seems to me that there's always going to be an escape boat, you know, that, hey, you know, we've designed something nice and cool. It looks very nice when you go in. Oh, my God, it's great. But nobody is going to come and say, hey, you have you done the testing? Have you done the QA? Have you done the security audit? And there's there's always going to be gray area in it. So you got to be very, very sure since we are still at the building block level, you know, and that there's still not a software that I can go. I think Abhishek will also and Arjit will also agree with me that uh, in the case of SaaS platforms, we are able to still go and upload something. Uh, it downloads to me some kind of a security audit uh, report. I can take a look at the audit report. I can see, okay, where the injection, external injections are and things like that. I can work on them, go back and again, redo the security audit. But in the case of a 3D immersive environment, what do I do? I can all I can upload is a G is FBX or a GLB file, and uh, what more can I do? You see, a very uh, very strange example, but I've been a user of this strange exact strange uh, strange product uh, a few months back. When this <clears throat> when this company reached out to me based on Delhi, um, who said that they can send avatars unlimited number of avatars just by giving a link of the experience. So I gave them a link of a spatial experience. And said, can you send avatars here? And they really sent out 75 avatars into the experience through a bot. Now, this experience is designed by a company that I truly admire, number one, because I've been showcasing them for many, many months, number one. Number two, I'm a great admirer of the founder of the company since, you know, I've already learned so much from him. And going to spatial by first going and clicking and doing a single sign on, then going into it takes about three or four minutes. He was able to send 75 bots in about five minutes by the watch. So the experience that I admire the most actually broke down because it was not built for 75 avatars with respect to the space. So you are you are literally looking at people who will not only think from a from just purely from a data perspective, they will think it from even making it bad. So while you could have a great experience on the immersive and you're running through a, a very nice event with hundreds, hundred CXOs from all over the world, you just don't know who can send the hundred bots into it and spoil your event. Is that not a breach? That is a very big breach. And I believe that those are areas which the executives, the people, I think, who are investing into it and the ones who are building onto it, they have to rethink about it, that the metaverse security is not just primarily around looking at the vulnerabilities from a software perspective they have to be looked at from an experience perspective they have to be looked at from a continuation perspective that while i am continuing with my efforts on building on building the metaverse experiences i must also ensure that um, all of them are being structured correctly and that no external bots or no external intervention is possible unless and until it's um, it's it's sort of unless and until it just breaks down completely next one <clears throat> yeah, next one. Um, this is a uh, this is the um, a, a personal recommendation. You know, I think for everybody who is either building the metaverse or is going into the metaverse, uh, we are very less aware of the of the impact of uh, uh, of the metaverse. Uh, you know, I think we have to understand that uh, if in a physical world that. Uh, we a recent uh, episode of uh, someone um, uh, someone in in the railway station of patna had uh, started a movie which was not a you know an, an sort of a adult content uh, thing in the station i mean i believe that in a virtual world that has a very very big uh, uh, very very big um, uh, issue in terms of it, it, in terms of controlling as to what content can go where. So I think user education with respect to where the right content is, uh, user user uh, awareness with respect to uh, 
what to do when when there is any any breach around the content within the metaverse is and how to report it and where to report it within the organization or within the you know the uh, within a ecosystem is very very important um having the um, multi factor multi factor authentication either a single sign on or um, um or i believe that um even if it's a it's a decentralized chain uh, login using a metamask or something there has to be i think the second level of authentication by the experiences that are being created on those chains um by having that you are at least sure that you aren't getting uninvited guests into your experiences on say the central land sandbox etc um and i i'm a person who believes in um, you know uh, on the ground sort of improvements uh, not something uh, where i just simply go write it down and people have to go follow it i think it has to be the way of life um it's very important that uh, the vulnerabilities with respect to the user journey within the metaverse is also looked at very carefully um it's not it's not um uh, uh genuine for me to sort of uh, sit down and expect that we will do it every week but um, while uh, these are not things that can be done every week but uh, organizations who are at least having those experiences must work hard on making sure that they periodic security checks and audits next one um the 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 way um uh, the way i think in india uh, since uh, all of our viewers uh, the, the ones at least from india i think will and and we as speakers here uh, panelists here uh, come from an indian perspective or sort of a law perspective thing it's we very far off from gdpr we very far far off from the privacy laws and things like that in india um it is it is uh, it is going to be a long uh, journey um, but having lesser and lesser content i think having most minimalistic data retention or data collection in the experiences will be more suitable in my view of going forward because if companies are looking at to just collect too much of data from within the you know uh, immersive experiences that sort of I, i don't know how much of that data really makes sense um and secondly i also believe that uh, this is my belief system which may differ from the other panelists here but but i don't see most of commerce going to be done within the metaverse i personally don't think that there's going to be a there's going to be a shopping commerce i mean there is going to be nfts and digital assets being sort of uh, transacted but whether will there be a physical aspect in the immersive experiences being built that stores will have virtual stores and excuse me brands will have virtual stores and the people will have to go people will go and click on the um click on any one of those you know uh, jackets or suits or whatever and then and then buy it from there i think they ultimately buy it from the website itself so making i think now now and going forward very important that um we look at from a metaverse development perspective we look at creating experiences which are straightforward and not look at just collecting too much of data you know let let that be in the flow we are a, we are a visualization team we are a visualization community we should must most focus on visualization and creating checks and balances uh, from day one with respect to ensuring that the the overall ecosystem with respect to security inside the metaverse is taken care of next one yeah that's pretty much i think from my end um th- this one is is the same uh, which i which i discussed earlier as well that there is going to be regulatory inv- uh, you know involvement with respect to uh, crypto and um, and uh, and uh, maybe decentralized chain sort of transactions uh, which is far off in indian context um i personally believe that standards with respect to uh, the the metaverse as are still not there it will still take a long time long time from here it is the responsibility of people who create experiences then waiting for uh, you know uh, any other sort of a industry body to come and create it and of course at the end like i said stakeholder collaboration remains to be one of my core Im- very very important um view points because um as community if we all talk about it if we all sit down and you know and and sincerely work towards uh, making uh, some sort of a visual sort of an understanding between the between the ecosystem that when you design something bases the criticality of the experience that you design um think around it and user journey user journey user flow whatever take care of it making sure that you aren't giving uncontrollable right 
to the user who comes in. Make sure that the user who comes in has a controllable right within the within the within the experience that you're creating. So that's pretty much from my end. And um, yeah, and look forward to any questions that comes up here on the live. Yeah. Sure, Rahul. Thank you for shedding light on the expect from point of cybersecurity point of view on the metaverse. We do have received a number of questions for all the speakers on the same. So first question is for Abhishek for that. Like you mentioned uh, that there are multiple companies outside the IT landscape, such as Versace, there was Adidas and few other companies that are trying to integrate or investing in the metaverse technology. So how do you think that uh, metaverse is going to change the way we are working or collaborating with each other? Thanks, Marshu. A very interesting question. And I think uh, Ariji did kind of uh, give a very good example when it came to, you know, if you see a persona, I think um, probably Abhishek had something to do with <clears throat> disturbance with respect to internet looks like, isn't it? I believe so. So yeah. again, um, in the meantime, we can move to the other questions as well. So, sir, like you mentioned about that, there is a lot of groundwork that needs to be done in terms of making metaverse secure. So uh, what do you think that how does metaverse affects our sense of identity, privacy, and uh, agency? Question to me or uh, to... Mr. Yeah, Rahul, would you like to answer this? So you can also add. I think Abhishek is back. Sorry, suddenly I saw this uh, buffering and, uh, you know, like I said, uh, we are overcomplicated. So if there's no internet, there's no metaverse, right? So <laughs> this has happened to me when I was trying to answer that. But uh, just to take that point, right? Uh, so Arijit made a fantastic point about how, you know, you see someone on the metaverse and you choose to pick the right, the same costume or the same clothes and you want to transact and buy, right? Uh, now, I'm a huge... Uh, I'm a huge uh, FIFA fan online right now. If I go and uh, I'm playing a game, just for example, and I see there is a merchandise of, say, Adidas or Nike on that and a player is wearing it. Now, there could be a personalization where I go and choose to look that up. And, uh, you know, while it and uh, I kind of resonate to what Rahul also mentioned that you possibly don't want to go and buy from there. But what you could do is you could go identify, look it up, that click takes you to the website of say an Adidas or a Nike and then you transact from there right but essentially you kind of end up saving a lot more monies on uh, you know digital advertising etc which was otherwise very static right so you would want to go and check it up online and uh, find it on the metaverse so to answer the point Manchu, a lot of brands are getting into augmented reality based uh, shopping wherein uh, and I'll give you an example of a major paint and consumer company uh, you know headquarter of mumbai and they've got a huge experience center in bandra where uh, you go you sit down they'll give you a, a set of uh, you know vr glasses and uh, you can actually customize how your and you got to send a picture of your say living room your bedroom your kitchen uh, they will they will make it in such a way uh, that through your vr you can put in the paints the color of the paints the color of the finish the wallpapers and you can walk in and see how your house will look exactly with those paints, the finishes, and the colors, right? So imagine that, uh, you know, while you you choose and sitting out of that sofa there, you can see how your house of the future can look with the exact specification, with the same furniture that you already have uh, through uh, augmented reality, right? So the same way, if, uh, you know, if, if there is a brand who is putting up all these things on the metaverse, essentially it is about customer engagement for you to look up things that, possibly would have otherwise taken you a trip to the store or, you know, you would have looked it up online, but not have the right sort of customizations on yourself, on your size and fits, on your look and feel, et cetera, which the metaverse does. But what it essentially does is it it helps the, the retailer. And again, I, I take a point that uh, I think Rahul made was 
about how brands get to know a little bit more about you as well in terms of your choices, your personalizations, your, uh, you know, in terms of what your likings are. And then it kind of gives you that sentiment from stickiness perspective, right? Now, if, if you see that I am going to say the metaverse of, uh, say, Skyscanner, right? And I spend time looking up places in terms of the travel that I want to make. Will I be able to get discounts from, say, a booking.com or, say, a hostel world or hotel uh, world to send me those kind of predictive stuff that, hey, you're looking up tickets here. This is what we have in terms of it. Today, the internet does that, right? It's not that the internet doesn't. But what the metaverse could do is actually show this could be your room, say, sitting out of Bali, if you choose this category. Or this could be your the ease with travel in which we will ensure that your flights are booked. This is your journey. This is how your hotel will look. This is your entire transit. You know, imagine that experience of being on the metaverse and looking and feeling that rather than just getting those smart coupons in terms of the discount because I looked up, say, a hotel, then this is the flight and vice versa, right? So that's, I think, the next generation and the next sort of evolution that's going to happen on the metaverse for these brands. Okay. Uh, so, Vishay, like you just mentioned about the application, I do have a follow-up question for that, and this includes Arjit also. So, as much as my viewers, or I can understand that the application of metaverse is most of the times limited to the marketing or the sales prospects or uh, but uh, do you think that it is also application in terms of business operations what are their potential or what are their opportunities in that area yes sir yeah uh well uh, let me first uh, redefine the system that i was actually sharing and then uh, i'll come back to this question give me two minutes to explain that the system is not that you are choosing the dress just like uh, the character. It's uh, more of that. So what we are doing, we are actually engaging lot many communities in the villages. We are teaching them how to design those kind of high fashion garments. And then we are supplying those garments to the local stores, which is in Southeast Asia, and telling them that uh, while playing games, somebody may come to your store and say that, I'm going to scan my phone to your system and I need a discount to the dress. So what happens? All these garments which is being manufactured here in India in very, very poor areas, those are being sold to those stores itself. It's not through the e-commerce portal, but through the fan base of gaming, which eventually yielding income generation for all these villages. So when we talk about, uh, I'm giving an example of game, but when you integrate those kind of systems into Metaverse, the opportunities are really huge. Now, coming back to this question, well, definitely in business, um, I know during the COVID time, there is a company um, they start of US who felt that they should improvise and increase how they can do manufacturing because their manufacturing unit is in Asia and their main management team sits in USA. So utilizing such kind of system of virtual world, not exactly a gaming world, rather a 3D immersed virtual world in, uh, integrating the extended reality and definitely a couple of different hardware devices they started doing all those kind of business decision, including the board meeting, including the manufacturing process and giving instruction to the team leader to do the exact kind of manufacturing. So if we go back to this question, it's not about sales and marketing. I think in near future, the possibilities are huge, but it completely depends uh, how we are going to adopt such kind of technologies, how we are going to teach the uh, next layer of employees and adopt such kind of technology to improvise things. I can go on with another last example. I can go on with many, but uh, because of time, probably take only one example. During this time zone, um, if you if you know uh, from uh, various perspective, movie makers are utilizing these kind of technologies to communicate in between the director and the actor, so that the actors can act using these kind of 3D projection technology to understand what they need to do. And they are doing it in some other location wherein the post-production and pre-production team is sitting in another location. They are not moving from one part of the world to another part of the world, saving time, saving money, saving everything. So I think we are, we are more of talking something which depends on how we adopt technology, integrate and move forward rather than probably thinking of it as a challenge. Abhishek, would you like to add something to that? 
I'll just add another point um, to what Arijit said. That if you look at it, when it comes to the supply chain sides of the world, right? Now, supply chain logistics, um, especially when it comes to the pharmaceutical industry or when you see the, the oil and gas sectors or, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, the metal and mining sectors, these are three industries which have always had uh, two challenges. One is in terms of the, the nature of discovery, right? It could be in terms of in pharmaceuticals. We've all seen how because of digital, uh, the vaccines for COVID came out in record time, right? But then if you look at it, there was so much of, uh, it just didn't come out, you know, because they thought that it would work, right? There was there was a lot of testing and a lot of validations, a lot of clinical trials, etc. Now, obviously, people would have their individual views on that. But what I'm kind of hitting on is that the, the, the time to market, right, for pharmaceuticals, the time to market for logistics and oil and gas, and for metals and minings is a classical case of how metaverse can really work, improvise and improve the operational bits of something which were the end touch points, right? So if I look at uh, you, me identifying those boxes, right? And I'm going to pick up a data point that uh, I think Rahul was mentioning in terms of how do you pick up those samples, right? Now, if I am, uh, say, an X company looking to get onto the farms, you know, a, a vaccine production, I would look at the clinical trial group in terms of what are the people out there, reach out to them possibly once, you know, Metaverse obviously gets, I'm, I'm talking about the art of possibility. When people can actually have those user groups created with the amount of data that comes in with the amount, you know, the kind of side reactions, uh, the, you know, the uh, adverse effects, the reportings, the clinical trial findings, etc. I already have a user group created on day one rather than me spending six months identifying people, right? So that's the first it, it just kind of uh, cuts out the entire noise of the identification process. So that's only because of the data set. The second is using the power of the metaverse where you can you can reach out to multiple sample sets, right? Have those identification pieces created, mm -hmm. have those transactions. And when I'm talking about transactions, I'm not talking about the monetary transactions. I'm talking about having those Q&As, the follow-ups, the training sessions, the guidelines in terms of what to do, what not to do, what to report, how to report, all of that online. And on top of it, to actually have the entire value chain created on the metaverse rather than having those workshops, all the trainings, all those batches, etc., done physically. I think it, it it cuts down a lot of time, which otherwise would have gone on to these basic parts of it. When it comes to the R&D side of it, right? The, the biggest point for any pharmaceutical company is the molecules, the the uh, the bill of material, the recipe, the APIs, which actually go to it. Now, on the metaverse, there is a fantastic way of actually making all of this virtual. You test the molecules, and like uh, Arijit was saying, you know, you might have uh, the doctor-patient relationship in different places. You might have an actor-producer relationship in different places. Here, what you're doing is actually having a production facility say maybe if i'm in mumbai and production facility in in uh, buddy in himachal or in uh, you know somewhere in, in gujarat and they already having three through 3d printing through molecular uh, dysfunction through track and trace serialization understanding what needs to go into the production so that when the green light comes in from the regulatory bodies our production is up and running on day one rather than actually waiting for that production you know to have those plants up and running through the state of art technologies the processes all of them defined. And, and that's that's the, I would say, the possibilities that the metaverse can have in the future from an operation standpoint, rather than what it can do only purely from transactions. Okay. Uh, so, Abhishek, uh, like you uh, just said that the metaverse is used in oil and gas. So, where the yeah. metaverse is used in like seismic surveys, geological equipment, because the oil and gas is basically under the ground. So, how yeah. we are using these technologies in oil and gas especially? Yeah, so I'll tell you, uh, this is a company in the Saudi which uh, is trying to invest onto this, right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it's not classical metaverse, but what they're trying to do is, is it's a culmination of uh, uh, a little bit of uh, IoT uh, and a con con culmination of AI bit to it, right? So what they're trying to do is identify uh, the right sort of areas for new drill work coming in uh, to understand the geo, uh, or rather the geographic implications of doing it contacting several you know ecologists and geologists across the region to find out their sample of what they've identified in fact i was lucky enough to be part of one of those sessions where uh, you know this group was actually discussing the 
implication of weather change, implication of soil erosion, implication of understanding how much time it would take to make that drilling possible. And all of these conversations were actually happening on a, on a meta class, right? So what they did was have different avatars created for different geographies of right from the worker skill set to the people who are going to be the scientists on the ground, have those meta avatars created, have those transaction sets created, and then the plant, you know, in terms of how it would look. So uh, I don't know if you all played Minecraft or some of those, uh, you know, games earlier, but it could actually show you in terms of how the farm of land would be, where would the uh, the drilling happen, where would the plant happen, where would the upside downside happen, how would the logistics flow, where would the office be built. All of this was wonderfully charted out uh, in a actual avatar and not just through a map or a design, right? And this was all done at least six months before the real groundwork or the first sort of, uh, I would say, the first machines go into this land. But this was already planned out and the real working model is already created. Okay. Uh, you know, Arjit, like you just gave an example of use of the metaverse for filming in different locations. How is it different from using green screen in the film industry for filming things? No, 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 it's not at all. It's not at all utilizing the green screen. It's all about the process. It's not the shooting part only. So this is more of like uh, using that entire process. Okay, I'll, I'll try to make it simple. For an example, if you create a storyboard, depending on the storyboard, usually uh, a, a production guy, they give input to the actor, actress, and the other crews, right? And uh, for that reason, they need to be present in that particular location. Now imagine a situation, you have a virtual world wherein you can actually project it using the 3D avatars before doing that shooting, right? So it's not about the green screen. So you are actually optimizing the entire cost by optimizing the human brain, saying that, okay, fine, if you are dancing, maybe for one and a half minutes dance, for that particular shoot, you need to invest a lot of time, money and movement, right? Of huge number of crews. But if, before you do that, if you have that situation of optimizing all these kind of movement, all these kind of faces, all these kind of pictures, all these kind of process, all these steps with a predefined method, then your number of crews are not moving that much. A, B, the number of machines and systems are not required. C, the most vital part actor actress they do understand better what they need to do utilizing those kind of ai generated movements and the 3d projected images so that's what i mean it's not the green chroma screen wherein you wipe out the background and then put them in a maybe you are shooting in mumbai and you are showing himachal it's a very old technology of using green chroma screen i'm not at all talking about that i'm talking about optimizing the back end process of any production house I'm more talking about the businesses which is getting uh, rather more values, whoever is adopting it. It's costly nowadays because it's pretty new in the market and a lot many talks are there, a lot many, um, you can say, gray areas yet to be developed. But yes, like like uh, the Abhishek said just now, uh, the way things are done in Saudi Arabia, just like the same, you can see a lot many different uh, verticals are emerging. If you look at uh, Japan, if you look at Taiwan, if you look at South Korea, you will see people are working in amazing technology, like very hard to explain in a video call, to be very honest. It's more easy to show rather than, you know, explain. Okay. So like Abhishek just mentioned, and you also mentioned in the earlier presentation that uh, currently major application of metaverse is in in the form of avatars and so can we say that the currently a uh, maximum impact that we can see of metaverse will be limited to e-commerce and online shopping it is going to transform the online shopping experience what would you like to say rahul on this online shopping and virtual stores is not the metaverse it is going to be much more than that um, a brand that a brand that comes to me and says that our uh, target persona is um, 
an ethnic ethnic wear brand where uh, where it is being uh, the per customer persona of theirs is between 25 26 year old to 45 year old women and the most of the suits or the or the dresses are costing more than 5 to 7000 rupees um, and every agency has gone to them and said hey you need a virtual store and uh, they they were they they called me up if talking to me and uh, uh, in my in my in my conversation i said neither is virtual store your should be your priority and nor is even a 26 year old girl your customer persona she said this defies the principles of the metaverse because it's made, meant for young people it's meant for this i said no once again you are an ethnic wear brand you want people to be people to have brand recall so go create a small experience of your company name and say um, say some center of some center of performing arts now bring the seven forms of dance manipuri bharatnatyam something give people that one hour training one hour of the dance training every day she said okay to whom because 26 year old i said 26 year old uh, is 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 busy she is trying to make her career okay she is going to go get married or she is going to getting married already isn't it at 26 what was my priority my priority was not to go look at look at something in the evening some metaverse no but the 45 year old women or 45 50 year old women should be your target persona because she has a daughter who is 22 23 and she is your customer in the next two years so if you go and go and create a uh, you know forms of dance and you uh, you tell a 50 year old mother uh, you know uh, some bit some mother okay even if we tell ancha's mother saying you know uh, we we are going to have some form of dance and she is the customer of that brand she will tell her to go there for an hour and you know and i think you'll be happy to do it so you have a connect with the brand so e commerce is uh, generally will never have a direct direct correlation with respect to shopping that's why I said commerce will play a very limited role in the metaverse. Of course, some digital commerce will happen. NFTs will happen and digital assets or digital asset transactions will happen. But they, they will they will never have a profound impact in the existence of the metaverse. They will have an impact, but it will never be a profound impact. The profound impact will always be for for the brands who want to really create value by doing persistent activities within the metaverse. Um, did you ever, did you or did I ever heard a name called a Flipkart shop in 20 years back? Did anybody heard that shop called Amazon, uh, Amazon General Store? No. So Amazon came up as Amazon came up, Flipkart came up for a certain reason. And then they, they, their brand, their businesses resonate to e-commerce. Similarly, in the metaverse also, newer Amazons will get created. I don't know the names of those Amazons, but those will be relatively the ones who will excel in terms of serving the community of the 100 million, going forward the 200 million, going forward the 500 million people within that virtual world who, who continue to come and collaborate with each other. And at the same time, business to business will have a very, very huge, uh, in very, very huge uh, and a very profound uh, experiences being built by businesses in my view. Yeah. Okay. So uh, as we all know that metaverse is here to stay. So from a different point of view, that what are the key skills and competencies that are required to thrive in the industry, to thrive in the metaverse space? Okay. Um, well, I think at a high level, every single, first of all, the metaverse is what metaverses are. So the ones where uh, most of the settled metaverses have already gotten their own SDKs. Mm -hmm. So I think about C sharp and uh, general scripting languages, along with some knowledge of, you know, uh, SDKs being downloaded from, from those metaverses platform like decentralized spatial and so on and so forth. One can easily design an experience. That's one. Um, metaverses experiences, uh, at least the ones uh, which are non-gaming, uh, you know, uh, because a lot of gaming platform also are claiming to be the metaverse here now. But non-gaming non-gaming experiences don't take much of an effort in the sense it is still not a rocket science when it comes to designing a metaverse experience inside a true metaverse. Number one, number two, from I think creative aspect and creative quotient of when you design, when you think of a user journey, when you think of the user experience per se. That's most important thought process in terms of elevating your end customer, customer or 
end user experience is the core to creating any great immersive experience you know isn't it abhishek uh, isn't it i mean will that just yeah, be a absolutely. programming yeah there's no programming programming really so i personally believe that if somebody uses common sense there is a fair chance that that person can be taught uh, programming and he can be doing good in the, inside the metaverse experiences but if common <coughs> sense is missing then i think it's hard to be in the industry because by then the person will make everything and suddenly the sense will walk in and it will be all nonsense so six months is gone isn't it so you got to be very you got to be having very good thinkers you got to be having very good storyboarding people with you very creative thinkers and uh, and practical thinkers so that's the most important skill set i believe that that's needed yeah and ironically rahul uh, the point that you made about you know uh, having good coding uh, on the metaverse right to get or rather create good personas on the metaverse there are a lot of uh, chatter about some of these education or e education hubs trying to get onto metaverse to teach coding right so is the other way around as well <laughs> where uh, they, they they say why don't you come onto the metaverse and learn coding from us here and go back to the real world you know so that's always the catch when you do something that's new when it's like this when a company reached out to me and said they are they are a interviewing company based mm-hmm. out of pune and uh, they do some uh, 100000 interviews a month or something <laughs> a very very um, a very settled company and said we want to have people go do the interview in the metaverse and i'm stretching my head thinking why do you want people to go to the metaverse and and do interviews uh, that t- assessment i mean the assessment not the interviews assessment i'm stretching my head why do you want to do that because a programmer writes the system checks right whether the syntax he's writing is is right or wrong why do you want to just go to the metaverse a lot of companies are are um, are considering but it's meant for only 10 or 15% of the brands i always say for any brand for any industry metaverse was never built for 100% on the left hand side the 10 15% brands or 10 15% of the total volume of the company's notional number but almost the almost 1/10 would be there and would exist on the metaverse the the right hand side of the 100 million people who are either gamers or or support the or the folks who are continuing to go there and learning how to be in the 3d world <clears throat> whether on the web vr mobile whichever phone whichever way but they are trying to get in and becoming more and more interested that will continue to grow so while this while this 10 15% is notional number i have zero control i don't know but i am 100 and 1000% sure that this 100 million will become 500 million this nobody can stop because this in itself is a revolution that's happening inside the minds of the gen z and gen alpha so this is unstoppable whoever will whoever will find the opportunity within that within that persona within the people will fit in and so hence the newer companies will come and there is most possibility there is most the possibility that it is going to be next generation new brands that will get recognized within the metaverse ecosystem and not the ones who exist today so consider that if nike can make a nike land doesn't mean adidas was successful adidas was a big failure so mm-hmm. nike and adidas are no less as companies which means execution plays a big role so common sense execution common sense is equal to you know a storyboarding so all of that in ultimately has to be thought through well and i think uh, uh, rahul you are right and it kind of boils down to the advantages of what people find out right now i was just while this was going on uh, you know i just got a times of india you know news come in which says a chat gpt was used by a student in telangana to copy in his exams <laughs> right and uh, if if you look at it that news will only make 100 more students look at using chat gpt in their next exam so i think what the metaverse really requires is one such uh, really really successful sort of implementation of success and you're very right i think companies the larger ones at least some of the larger ones need to be there to showcase to the to the larger consumers that this is of trust and this is not just a game so you need to get there and obviously the smaller ones have already started ramping up and if you look at what say even brand names like tata are doing right tata new for example or something what they are essentially trying to build or for that matter when i i kind of understand what geo is looking at you know having one ecosystem created now with that amount of data with that amount of portfolio of products with the amount of trust that these brands already have 
they won't shy away from taking a dip into the metaverse to see how it really works because you're right there is a whole new generation waiting to test another sort of universe on the social web uh, or the the commerce web to see how that will work and i think it's not too far that you will see this being a conversation uh, maybe and i anticipate this another 18 to 24 months is ex extremely crucial for the metaverse to either expand big time or have its limitations created to the niche right so it really depends on that one successful case study which is going to impact a lot of lives across the country a uh, very senior abhishek uh, very very senior executive uh, called me up uh, completely resonates to what even arjit was talking earlier that uh, he said like the like the phone the, the mobile phone it revolutionized the the industry the auto industry it was a it was a path breaking technology path breaking technology for the human kind which also influenced the auto industry and said okay how he said 100 year back if you would have thought that somebody will put a phone space inside a car they would have laughed because phone was this big and there was no way that people thought that phone can also become wireless mm. now every good car from every good car meaning every car almost every car to the rolls royce of the world have a mobile connected charger mobile place to put put your mobile and things like that i said yeah i said the same thing will happen in the five in the next five or seven years from now when one of this technology you will probably have a tethered glass and the tethered the tethered glass is what so this will get sort of ultimately now link up to you as a wearable so this will become lifestyle products mobile will become lifestyle products although it has definitely a very important piece of our working life but mobile will become a will will become a a kind of a product or an equipment with us but we will have lifestyle products like the ar glasses and things like that we continue to wear it and everything will will we will like to do it on the glasses itself so yeah i mean um, i think this immerse immersive um, experiences are here to stay for a very long time nothing is happening with that uh, but of course i believe that um, I, i think as as we move ahead i think more and more clarity will come from meta versus you know experience creation point of view yeah great very good yeah any other question you want to yeah yeah uh, can i yeah yeah sure it I think the question was what are the skill that is uh, needed for creating a metaverse to be very honest coming from the coding and uh, definitely the finance background till date I code I would love to suggest uh, two language instead of only C# sharp python is one of the uh, biggest impact factor if you are really willing to build something on web 3.0 or going towards uh, the next generation technology then there is another uh, thing that you can look on that is rust and i i used to love another language called lua l u a uh, which is impacting from the back end part of it and eventually if you understand the database and uh, you have a little bit of understanding about normalization learning blockchain wouldn't be a big issue uh, for you interesting part himanshu you know if you look at uh, the, the people who have probably changed uh, a lot many things in uh, technology elon musk coming from gaming background um mm -hmm. steve jobs he has got an amazing game development background if you look at slush my good friend peter uh, the founder of lovio entertainment uh, we all are probably coming from crazy game development background unfortunately in india the mindset says that if somebody is creating game that means they are creating entertaining uh, things for for the kids which is not true if you look at the game development technology as a technology it is impacting lot many different verticals i i wish i can show all these things in my short presentation couldn't do it but to be very honest uh, there are training modules there are simulation systems which is being used from oil uh, and gas rigging companies through the game development technology just think of it as a technology perspective metaverse is actually coming from the vertical wherein um, rahul rightly said that lot of people are claiming that they have created metaverse when they are actually creating probably a 3d world but to be very honest i don't feel the very term metaverse is yet defined properly it's yet to be explored yet to be understandable by lot many of us and probably integrate it in a proper way until unless i had a chat with a uh, couple of guys from meta uh, what i understood from my small uh, 
knowledge and wisdom uh it's not going to be only the virtual world it's going to be the virtual and physical world connected with each other so definitely the new generation technologies the connected devices the iot's uh definitely the blockchain definitely the ar vr all these 3d characters meta human digital avatars ai based uh, chat engines whatever we are talking about probably we are yet to see the future and uh, i'll be waiting to see that i hope that i will uh, live that long <clears throat> thank you arjit and all the other speakers for shedding light on metaverse it was really an informative session uh, as we come to the end of the webinar i would like to thank each one of you again for your time and expertise we hope that this webinar has given our attendees some valuable insights and perspectives on the future of cyber security in the metaverse era and we encourage our attendees to stay connected with us and our speakers for more updates and resources on the topic thank you everyone thank you everyone thanks okay abhishek arjit himanshu and anjul thank you yeah. thank you